So I'm going to go ahead and do that now. Okay, so now we're recording the lecture. Uh, my guess is that a lot of you uh, that are going to be seeing this uh, haven't seen the live version, so I want to make sure we have everything there. Um, those of you that are seeing uh, this live version, uh, you'll can watch it again uh, to find the stuff. Uh, if there's stuff that I go through quickly, uh, you can, you know, obviously back, uh, go back. Uh, so good morning, everyone. Um, as I'm sure a lot of you probably had a chance to watch uh, the introductory video, um, my name is uh, Dr. Minda, and this is uh, Psychology 2135, uh, Cognitive Psychology. Uh, hopefully you're, you're in the right place. Um, that's one of the things I probably, well, maybe you don't really miss this from uh, being on campus, but uh, you know, every year when I would start this class, uh, sometimes there'd be somebody in the wrong room. So remember those good old days before the pandemic when you could accidentally walk into the wrong classroom? Uh, it doesn't happen as easily uh, when it's an online Zoom class, right? Because who's going to accidentally Zoom into the wrong class? But I assume that all of you are here um, because you're enrolled in this class. Uh, so I'm going to go through a few things. Um, I said we'd probably begin uh, lecture content at 9.33. Uh, by my time, it's 9.33 right now. So um, my TA is going to continue to let people in uh, from the uh, waiting room uh, so that everyone's uh, able to watch. Uh, but let me go through a few things uh, about how I want this lecture to go first. Uh, then I have some PowerPoint slides. I'll show you where to find them. Uh, and uh, we'll spend maybe the first 10 or 15 minutes uh, sort of just a little bit will be review of what I talked about in that initial video. I just want to make sure everybody knows where to find things. Uh, in, you know, when delivering a real lecture uh, in person, very easy to do this kind of thing, right? I can uh, take lots of time to sort of space things out, make sure I can make announcements every week. Uh, this class would have normally met twice a week. Uh, so it would have been a Tuesday, Thursday lecture. That's what it would have been scheduled for if we were in person. There's lots of time to make those announcements right over the first two weeks. Uh, it's a little bit different now because uh, I feel like I only have one chance to make it. Um, so let's, uh, let's, let's begin. Uh, I'm gonna start by uh, doing what uh, everybody does, which is I'm gonna start by sharing my screen. Uh, and I wanna go a few, uh, through a few things first. Um, and then we'll get into the actual content uh, for this week. So I'm just going to go ahead and share the whole desktop because I've got a, a number of different things uh, we're going to be looking at. Uh, but first off, um, let me just go ahead and start with uh, the Teams site. So most of you, but uh, probably not all yet, uh, have joined the Microsoft Teams site for this class. Now I'm not running anything official through Teams. Uh, what I'm doing is using it as I sort of explained in the uh, preliminary lecture. Uh, we're just going to use this for communication. I think it's a really good uh, way uh, to, uh, uh, to communicate with people in this type of setting. So when I taught my uh, third year course last term, uh, there were only 110. There's 300 in this class, but there were only 110. Um, and one of the things that I found, because everything was online, uh, I don't have the opportunity to ask questions and answer questions, you know, in front of you in person, uh, is that it increased the number of emails, uh, questions. I don't mind answering emails from students, but I do worry that sometimes I'm going to lose them. Uh, and my concern for a class of this size uh, with 300 students uh, is that between the TA and I, it would be I, just, I was worried I was going to lose the emails, and I wouldn't, uh, you know, they'd, they'd drop off the front uh, page of my email uh, inbox, uh, and I might not reply, or I might, you know, archive the email and think I replied, uh, whereas using a system like this makes it a little bit easier to keep things, tr to track things just for this course. I've got all of the communication for this course in one place. So for those of you that uh, have never used this system before, uh, I'll show you a little bit about how I'd like things to run. For those of you that have some experience, maybe this will be a review. Uh, for those of you that haven't joined the team site, uh, there's lots of uh, places on the OWL page where you can uh, find this information. Uh, the easiest uh, way to find the information, let's go ahead to the OWL page uh, for this class, um, is right over here on the left. You'll see it says MS Teams. Uh, when you click on that, it's going to take you to either, it's going to take you to one of two places, 
uh, either the web version of Teams or the Teams app if you have it installed. I'd recommend installing the app because it gives you a little bit more control over notifications. Uh, but you can do everything that you need to do in the web-based version. Uh, there's also a mobile version, uh, as you can see. I've turned most of my notifications off for this uh, while we're doing uh, the lecture, but uh, I wouldn't recommend that you leave all the notifications on on your device because that'll get a little bit too confusing, but it's there, right? Uh, so you can manage this uh, across all your different uh, devices easily. Uh, so there's a couple of ways I want to manage it. First of all, in this general channel, uh, this is where sort of general announcements will be made. Uh, and things like you'll see in the files tab up here, um, things like the, uh, uh, the course outline uh, is posted here. Uh, as I, I mentioned to several of you, uh, the ninth edition for the textbook is the one that I've recommended. That's the one that's in uh, print and available now. Uh, I have a PDF copy of the eighth edition, which is perfectly acceptable. Uh, if you want to use that, you can just download the version of the eighth edition of the textbook here because you can't really buy the eighth edition anymore. It's not in print. Um, so there will be some general stuff up here. Uh, and the posts uh, are in this uh, posts directory. I want to show you something really quickly here. So this is uh, a really great example of why I like this platform uh, over uh, an email-based platform. Uh, and here is something that I um, posted the other day uh, saying, I hope you're enjoying the weekend. Well, you, you can, I'm not going to read it out loud. You can see it for yourself here. Um, and I said, uh, somebody asked, is this a textbook chapter? And I said, yes. Uh, then someone else asked uh, where the link to subscribe to the online calendar was. Now, I hadn't had a chance to, um, uh, to reply to that one yet, but one of your one of your colleagues, one of your classmates replied, that's terrific. This is actually the best thing I could, this is all I could ever hope for, uh, is that uh, someone else would step in and answer the question uh, and that you would help each other. Uh, that's terrific. This is exactly how I want this platform to work. I'll be answering anything uh, that you specifically direct to me. Uh, but uh, for a lot of these questions, if you know the answer, go right ahead and answer it for someone else. Uh, and it's just going to be faster. As you can see, uh, if you really want to get my attention, uh, let me show you one other thing really quickly here. Um, you can change your notifications. So as you'll see, um, I went into my activity feed on the left. I went into the uh, little gearbox here uh, and under custom notifications, I have mine set so that I'm only going to get a notification if someone mentions the entire team or if someone specifically calls me out with the at symbol. Otherwise, I'll just read them as I need to. I won't get all of the notifications. I'd recommend you set it that way uh, so that when I notify the entire team by writing at psychology2135, you will get a notification. Uh, or if someone else calls your name out, you'll get a notification. But if someone else likes something or uh, puts a, you know, a smiley face on it or whatever, uh, you won't necessarily get those notifications. Um, so as you can see, we're still admitting people to the, oh, we've got 104 of you here. That's great. Um, so where was I? I'm getting distracted here. Um, okay. Uh, so anyway, that's how the team site is going to work. Um, under our teams here, uh, I'm going to run everything for the first section. So on the course outline, you see that we have several lectures and then an exam. Uh, everything under that first section, uh, we're going to just talk about in section one. So next week's class will also be posted in section one. And I'll just say, hey, everyone, here's the next class. And I'll do something like this. Uh, I'll announce it. I'll make sure you know where it is. Uh, all of the Zoom links will be exactly the same Zoom links uh, for, uh, uh, for every lecture. And I just want to make sure that All right, I was just checking my chat to make sure nobody had mentioned any uh, concerns here. Um, one of the things, of course, I'm concerned about is uh, internet speed. Uh, you've all been in Zoom meetings before, uh, and you've probably uh, seen these Zoom meetings before where um, uh, the, uh, 
sorry, I'm trying to find something here, uh, where people freeze up, right? Uh, so most of you don't have your, I don't think any of you have your cameras on. Uh, if it turns out that I'm going to freeze up from on your end, so let's suppose your internet cuts out, uh, Zoom cuts out, and you don't see anything, I won't really know about that. And, you know, really, it's not going to affect the recording. Uh, so from my end, uh, even if the internet goes out everywhere, as long as Zoom keeps running on my end, I'll be able to record this lecture and share it with you and you'll be able to see everything. So if you all went offline, uh, I'd still just keep going. Um, if I go offline, uh, the only thing I'm worried about is that sometimes Zoom restarts. I guess if that happens, we'll restart the meeting and I'll just uh, start recording again uh, and we'll pick up from there. So there's a lot about this. I have no idea how well it's gonna work. I just hope that it's gonna work uh, in general. Okay, um, so if you have questions during uh, this lecture, uh, please uh, add them to the chat uh, window. Uh, I'll check over there periodically, uh, and Maz, my TA, uh, will notify me if there's something uh, that came up, uh, but feel free to interrupt uh, the lecture. Uh, so I'll continue to monitor the chat window uh, and uh, uh, make sure that I can see if there's anything, uh, anything that I need to pay attention to. Okay, so is everybody doing all right? It looks like we've got about 105 and that's been kind of stable. So I'm gonna go ahead and start with the content now. One of the nicest things about working from home, by the way, uh, is that I, I sort of have an endless supply of coffee. Um, you know, we just keep making it. Uh, whereas when I used to lecture, uh, I think the last time I taught this, it would have been in the, um, was it in the engine? No, it was in health sciences. Uh, so it was in that uh, HSB 240 uh, lecture hall, which is big enough. Uh, now this is 300, so that wouldn't have been big enough for that. But uh, so, you know, we might take a break, but uh, you know, if I was going for an hour and a half uh, to two hours, there was no, really no time to take a coffee break. And you know what it's like, you probably miss being on campus, but uh, one of the things I do not miss is going down to the Tim Hortons uh, at the half hour mark, uh, right before our class uh, and begins, you know, so like at 925, everybody, like 30 people lined up for Tim Hortons. Uh, so yeah, not necessarily missing that. Um, it looks like we, I got some stuff in the chat. Uh, oh, do we have access to the slides before the Zoom? Everybody's answering that question for you already. Um, so I just saw that. Let me go ahead and show you where those are if you didn't already get the answer. Uh, it looks like many people have answered that question already. So thank you, uh, uh, thank you, Jordan uh, and others. Uh, let me just explain a few things briefly about uh, where to find these things. I'm gonna put them on OWL also, and I just, I, I forgot, uh, frankly, this morning uh, to put the, um, uh, to put things on, uh, uh, to put things on OWL yet. Uh, they are going to be on OWL after I'm done recording them, but uh, here's where you can go to find uh, the files. So under files in section one, uh, you'll see folders for each one of our lectures. Uh, and under intro, you will see unit one intro.ppx. Uh, you can simply download uh, and then you can uh, take notes. Uh, there is one caveat to this. Um, so these are, if you click on it, it'll open it up in your web-based PowerPoint uh, because these are on a SharePoint that you have access to. I think, um, that if you open, just click and open it, you'll be able to view, but you won't be able to edit it. Uh, so you have view access online. I think you should have no restrictions if you download it to your own device and make your own copy. Uh, I would have just left it up here with uh, edit access, uh, but I didn't want it to be the case that, you know, you would inadvertently start taking notes and that everybody would be taking notes on the same, uh, on the same slide. So, um, just use these uh, buttons here to download. I am going to send a copy of these uh, over to um, uh, over to OWL. I forgot to do that this morning. Uh, and I'm also, of course, going to have the video posted on OWL and posted uh, in the files directory here and posted on YouTube. That'll all be later uh, today. Uh, okay, someone else does answer. If you download it, you have edit access. Ter terrific. I assume you can, I'm sharing my whole screen, so I'm assuming you can see these chats, but if you can't, uh, someone else asked, you tested directly on content uh, or is it supplemental? Um, I'll go through this a little bit more 
uh, in today's lecture. But uh, the primary way to study for this uh, is to look for places where the textbook and the lecture notes overlap. I do test on things that are in the textbook, uh, and I do test on things that are only in uh, lecture, but most of the content is going to be on cases where, or be on material that's covered both in the lecture and in the textbook. Uh, so that said, uh, use either the eighth or the ninth edition for the textbook. Uh, if there's some small piece in the textbook or some uh, you know, a study that's mentioned, just a, a sentence that I never talk about it, and it's not a topic that we talk about, I'm not going to be, answer, be asking questions about that. Uh, I'll talk more about how to prepare for the exam uh, in a few weeks when we get a little bit uh, closer. So it says, so, we'll, so nothing will be just from the textbook. There's uh, yes and no. <laughs> Uh, I will, I may ask about things that are in the textbook uh, that are around concepts that I've dis discussed. So I may ask questions about things uh, for which the answer can be found in the textbook as long as the concept was covered in lecture. Uh, I will not pick out things from the textbook if I haven't talked about that concept. Uh, but yes, you can treat the, the, the textbook as a background resource. Uh, it can fill in some of the detail, uh, and I am not going to use the test bank uh, that comes with the uh, textbook uh, just to pick out things from the textbook. Uh, most of what you were going to be covering in the uh, exams are things that I'm going to be lecturing about. In fact, um, if you really one of the best ways to think about this lecture is that we're going to spend the next hour and a half to two hours me telling you what might be on the exam. Uh, that's really what this lecture is about. Uh, that's what all of my lectures are about. I'm covering the stuff that I think is the most important uh, aspects of cognitive psychology. And then we'll talk about those things uh, for the next two hours. And then I'll ask you about those things on the exam. So uh, think of this uh, lecture as a chance for me to tell you what might be on the exam. Uh, I don't test everything. Uh, I test some things, but there are no surprises in this class. I have no interest in trying to make uh, multiple choice questions that are uh, so hard that you won't be able to find them until you've located one single sentence uh, in the textbook uh, or in the uh, lecture notes. Uh, so I'm going to spend a lot of time telling you what you should study, uh, and then we'll review it. Uh, how long will this Zoom meeting be? Uh, I don't know, I'm thinking maybe 11.15 I'll be over, but I'm going to record the whole thing. Uh, if you need to leave, by all means leave. This is not a synchronous class, officially. Uh, this is not a required uh, part of the course. So you can stay as long as you like. Uh, you can attend some and not others. You can come late. Uh, it doesn't make any difference uh, in terms of your ability to uh, have the material you need. Um, I just think this is something that uh, would will help the way this class uh, happens. Because look, I'd never be able to answer these questions if I were just recording the lecture uh, up front. So I think this is a terrific way uh, to make sure that we all sort of kind of meet once, even though it's not a requirement and it's not a synchronous course. Um, what can we expect from the, uh, I'm gonna get back to some of these questions at VIX. I might not get to my lecture notes, but uh, I'm gonna answer this last one. What can we expect from the discussion portion? Uh, will it be on OWL? I'll talk about that next week. Uh, in a separate lecture, uh, and maybe in a separate announcement, because we don't have, um, uh, I haven't uh, set that up yet. So uh, the discussion uh, questions will be all part of that first OWL unit. Um, and what you will do is you'll find uh, a link to the discussion portion. And these are going to be very straightforward, simple questions. Uh, and I'll have some more information about that once I set that up. As you can see, uh, in our OWL uh, directory, uh, there's going to be a section here. It says the study of cognition. That's today's class. And there's like nothing in here yet uh, because I haven't recorded the lecture yet. That's what I'm doing now. So uh, once I'm finished recording this lecture, uh, I will uh, upload uh, and then this will be filled in to look something like uh, this. It'll have some goals. Uh, it will have a link to the discussion uh, forum at the bottom. Uh, so the way in which this course will run is I'll do the recordings on Tuesdays. This is our live lecture section. Uh, and then by later, you know, by Tuesday afternoon, uh, all of this information should be on the unit page. Uh, and I'll send an announcement around uh, on uh, messages. I'll send an announcement around in the, um, 
team site to let you know that that's all there. Okay, so I want to start off by uh, going through a few things. Um, I'm going to go through some of this a little bit. Um, some of this will be kind of quick uh, to go through, but I'm, I've got my screen shared here. Where's my... Okay, so you should see my first lecture. I'm going to pretend like we were in a lecture hall uh, and that, you know, uh, this is like a real introduction to the class, but uh, it's kind of hard to keep that illusion up. Uh, so here's what I wanted to uh, go over today, and we've already gone through some of the first part and some of the second part. Uh, so a lot of this is me just wanting to tell you where to find things, uh, how we're going to run the class, uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, I want to talk a little bit, though, about the study of cognition, and some of this overlaps uh, with um, information that's in the textbook. Uh, and then I want to talk also a little bit about what I think is actually the most interesting part of today's lecture, which is the last part, which is uh, understanding the role of cognitive psychology in uh, educational settings, like in the classroom, learning at home, uh, and that sort of thing. So real world applications uh, of cognition. Uh, and that's a topic we'll come back to several times, because one of the things I like about cognitive psychology is that um, there's a lot that you can use uh, to sort of, you know, there's a lot that you can use to make things uh, to, you know, in other classes, in your uh, daily life, understand more about how you think, uh, understand about how your memory works, understand about how you perceive things, how you make mistakes. Uh, all of those kinds of things uh, are going to be covered in this type of in this class. Um, so introductory uh, information. Hold on here. All right, there we go. Uh, so you know who I am. Uh, I'm part of the psychology department. I've been a member of the psychology department here since uh, 2003, uh, which guess maybe that's around, probably most of you were like one <laughs> in 2003. So I've been here for a long time uh, and I study concepts, categories, different kinds of thinking and behaviors. Uh, and my main interest uh, and which has been my interest as a researcher uh, from the time I was a postdoc and a grad student until now uh, is really understanding how people organize their experiences and make sense of the world and how those organizational representations, concepts, uh, affect their ability to solve problems, make decisions, uh, and so on. Um, so a little bit about my background, we'll just go five minutes. I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. That's where I grew up, actually a small town outside of Pittsburgh, uh, but it would have been kind of like growing up in, uh, let's say Milton and saying that mostly you're sort of from Toronto. If you weren't, you know, from people outside of the GTA, you might just say, well, I'm from kind of from around Toronto. Uh, so it might have been kind of like that. So I wasn't actually, didn't grow up in Pittsburgh, the city. It's a beautiful city. Uh, so yeah, I'm an American citizen. I'm also a Canadian citizen, so I'm a dual citizen now. Um, and I don't know if any of you are originally from the U.S. Uh, it's, I mean, I won't talk too much about uh, what's going on in uh, current affairs, but I mean, clearly there's, you know, the U.S. has, has gone a little nuts lately. Uh, and it's a little distra distressing to watch, watch it happen sometimes, but uh, that's, you know, that's just the way things are right now. But Pittsburgh itself is a beautiful city. Uh, I haven't been to the U.S. Uh, for about two years now, so obviously since COVID started, we haven't traveled anywhere. Uh, and I think the last time I had been uh, to visit family uh, in the area must have been 2018, maybe, uh, something like that. So it's been a while, maybe the summer of 2019. Uh, so, yeah, quite a while since I've been back, uh, but it's still a lovely place. Uh, I was an undergrad at a place called Hiram College, which is a small college in Ohio. Um, and if you can get your mind around this, Hiram uh, is, is, when I say it's a small uh, college, uh, it's a very small college. I think, uh, if, I, if I remember correctly, we may have had 900 students in all four years. So uh, this is smaller than Brescia College. Uh, smaller than the psychology program, uh, smaller than uh, any other program that you probably would know. Uh, in fact, the entire student body was smaller than Psych 1000. Uh, so it was a very small school. Uh, as you can see, it was a beautiful campus, uh, but small. Uh, got a master's degree from a, a university in Pennsylvania, Bucknell University, uh, and spent most of my PhD years uh, learning uh, about concepts and categories at the University of Buffalo. Buffalo, uh, you can see their campus. It doesn't really look uh, as picturesque as most other university campuses because most of it was built in the 1970s. Um, but it had some really nice features to it. Uh, and that is that you could get from any building to any other building without going outside, uh, which I thought was terrific because uh, the weather in Buffalo is as bad as it is here. 
right? Sometimes it's uh, just gray, uh, raining, cold, snowing. Uh, and it didn't matter which building you were in, unless you were going all the way over to the uh, stadium, uh, you could get to any academic building without ever going outside. So you could park, uh, walk inside, uh, everything was connected, it was terrific. Uh, I was a postdoc at the University of Illinois at the Beckman Institute, and I've been here. Uh, this is the old view of um, our beautiful campus uh, before they remodeled that. Um, I've been here since 2003. Uh, so I want to just briefly uh, mention some of this stuff. I think I already talked about some of these things, uh, but we wanted to talk about uh, where to find things on the OWL site. So that's uh, issue number one. I think you all know where everything is. Uh, the course outline is here on the left. Uh, you can download it or read it right in the directory. Um, the course calendar uh, can be found here. And as you saw in my uh, Teams directory, um, the course calendar can be subscribed to. Uh, so you can subscribe to the calendar uh, and put it directly uh, in your own Outlook or Google Calendar so that uh, when you click on a calendar item, uh, you should be able to see everything you see. There we are right here. Uh, so here it is, unit one recording. Uh, my other class is also, uh, is also run through an Outlook calendar. Uh, so everything you need should be here. All of the deadlines will be here. Uh, all of the links will be here. Uh, so I'll try to update everything as much as I can on the calendar. In theory, you could run a lot of this class by just tracking it on your calendar. Um, probably wouldn't be very interesting, but you could get, you get everything you need. Uh, so one, one thing you've probably realized uh, is that there's like four ways to find everything. Uh, so I'm trying to make this uh, as accessible as possible. Whatever time zone you're in, um, whatever uh, circumstance you're in, whatever your internet is in, whether you're living at home, whether you're living uh, in an apartment, uh, whether you have access to YouTube or you have intermittent access to email, uh, there's a lot of different ways to find things. You can just use OWL. You don't ever have to use any other platform. Uh, you can run this uh, through your own calendar. You can use Teams to find everything. Uh, but all of the lectures, all of the course outlines, all of the information should be duplicated across all of these different uh, platforms so that uh, you should, you know, you got to find you can find everything you need on Teams. You can find everything you need on uh, Owl. There's lots of ways to find things. Um, so you can join Teams here. Uh, you'll find GradeScope, which I think we talked about already, and I'll have more to say about that later. Uh, that's where the exams are going to be. Uh, exams will be uh, two hours long. There'll be multiple choice questions, um, and they will be run without uh, any kind of proctoring. So you'll have a 24-hour period in which you can take the exam. When you start the exam, the timer starts and you've got two hours to finish. Uh, so if you wanna take your exam uh, five o'clock in the morning, you get up, take your exam, that's great, go ahead and do it. Uh, you wanna take your exam at 8 p.m. at night, also fine. It doesn't make any difference from the class's perspective. Uh, as I mentioned uh, in the initial video, I'll be on Teams and I'll set up a separate directory just for exam discussion. Uh, and if you have questions about the exam, I'll try my best to get to those as quickly as possible. And I'll kind of like hang around at my computer, which let's be honest, that's what I do all day anyway. Um, I'll kind of hang around my computer, leave Teams on. And if you've got questions, I'll try to answer them uh, that way. Um, okay, just uh, checking, I saw some chats coming in. Uh, if there's anything, uh, by the way, that you don't, that you need to, you want to ask me, just, uh, you, know, you can raise your hand or you can stop or uh, you know, I'll be watching the chat over here. If there's something I need to answer, I'll try my best. And maybe I'll stop every few minutes and say, is there anything you want me to answer now? Because uh, that's what I would do in a lecture. I would say, does that make sense? And then I would pause and uh, you know, look around for hands and I could answer those questions. So I'll try to remember to do that kind of thing um, while I'm recording this. Okay, so where was I? So grade scope and exams, right? So the uh, grade scope, the way it works, it's gonna be linear, or it's not gonna be linear rather, you can go back and forth. Uh, so if you answer the easy ones, you can go back and answer the hard ones, which is what you would have uh, in a paper-based exam. Um, there's no proctoring, there's no proctor track, uh, there's no Zoom proctoring, but I'll be around on Teams uh, just to answer uh, questions. It's open book, it's open note. Uh, you'll have access to everything that you've taken, all the PowerPoints. Uh, I guess if I were in your shoes, if I were a student in this class, 
uh, I'd have all my PowerPoints downloaded and opened. Uh, and each question, I would, you know, try to find, try to find it in, uh, in my uh, PowerPoint uh, and I'll see if I could find the answer. Uh, I'd have my notes all there. Uh, if your notes are being taken by typing them like in OneNote or Word or something like that, uh, I would use the search function to find uh, terms. Uh, so if I ask about um, you know, spatial attention, let's say, or if I ask about uh, top-down processing, uh, then I would just do a global search for the word top-down processing in all the documents that I have open uh, and see which one has it. So you can imagine there's lots of strategies. Um, does that mean it's easier? I don't know. I don't know if it means it's easier or if it's more difficult. Uh, is it possible to cheat on this exam? Yeah, it's possible to cheat on this exam. It's possible to cheat on any exam. Uh, and I'm not going to worry too much about that. Uh, my main concern is that, uh, I guess my main concern is that you learn something interesting about cognition uh, and that you do reasonably well uh, on the exams. Okay, you'll find your grades here whenever we post them. Uh, and again, each week, uh, one of these will be uh, finished out. So today, the study of cognition, I'll fill all of that stuff out. Okay, let's go back here. The course website and the course outline we've talked about. Uh, so let's begin some of the content. I'm gonna have a little bit of, to say about why we wanna study cognition. Then I'm gonna have a little bit to say about, you know, very briefly about the history of the science of cognitive psychology. Uh, and then I want to talk a little bit about uh, cognition in real world settings. Um, timing, what time is it now? Uh, it's 10.04. Uh, more than likely, um, I'm going to probably take a break, a short break, uh, maybe just to get some coffee. So if we go to 10.45 and I haven't hit that cognition in the real world section, I'll probably say, let's take a break. I'll pause the recording uh, and then maybe I'll you know, refresh my coffee or something like that. And then we'll just come back. Uh, if we're making good progress, I'll just keep going. I've blocked out 9.30 to 12 for this, but I think it's really unlikely that I'm gonna use the entire time. And again, I don't anticipate that you'll need to stay here for all of it. Uh, feel free to jump back in and out whenever you want. So if you, uh, you know, walk over to get something or if you wanna uh, you know, leave the video and then come back in an hour, if it's still open, it's still open. Uh, it won't, I won't really even notice uh, because, you know, I'm not really monitoring that. Okay, so science of cognition. Uh, we want to study uh, human thought. So we're studying what people, how, how people think. Uh, and this means several different things. First of all, it means what kind of mental abilities are common to all of us. Uh, and that's really what some of the first uh, section is going to be about. We're going to talk about perception. Uh, perceptual abilities, visual perception, auditory perception, how people see, how people uh, hear things, how they put those together, how they pay attention to one thing and not the other. Uh, those are basic mental abilities that are common across uh, all humans, and they're, com they're common across most uh, other uh, species. Uh, so other mammalian animal species have a lot of the same abilities that we do. Uh, of course, they use them in different ways, uh, but things like selective attention, paying attention to one thing and not the other. That exists across a wide range of species, not just humans. Now, the ability to use past experiences like memory to make decisions about the future. Uh, you know, we do that all the time, right? We remember what we did last time, and so we do it uh, again. Uh, but so do animals, uh, so do cats, so do dogs. Uh, so do uh, you know, spiders, uh, insects, all sorts of uh, you know, organisms use prior experience to guide their future behavior. So these are common cognitive mechanisms. They're things that are can be computationally defined. We can describe how these systems work uh, with mathematics. So what do these uh, abilities tell us um, about behavior? Uh, and what do these abilities tell us about individual differences? Uh, you know, so maybe some of you are particularly good at uh, selective attention. Maybe you're able to focus on something. Maybe others, uh, maybe, maybe you find it a challenge to focus on something, but you're really good at uh, noticing things uh, sort of in the periphery. Uh, so there are individual differences in cognitive ability as well. Um, but more than anything, uh, we're going to spend especially the first half of this course talking about the study of information processing. So uh, before we can even talk about thinking, 
uh, we want to talk about how does the brain and the mind process information. Uh, so what is information? What do I mean by information? Uh, in this case, I mean any kind of potentially useful information. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of questions that come up with this. What does it mean for something to be potentially useful? Uh, how does an intelligent system, uh, whether it's me or you, uh, my cat, uh, a computer, how does a, an intelligent system let the useful information in, things that it can use to advance its own interests or to benefit from something, uh, and also keep the less useful information out? Uh, so that's a major question. Uh, and in fact, that's one of the main questions we're going to spend the first section, our first unit, talking about. Also, the science of perception and attention, for example, is all about letting the useful information in. Uh, so visual features, auditory features, uh, memories, uh, all sorts of things that you can use to um, behave appropriately, uh, to gain things. Uh, that's useful information. And less useful information are things that distract you from your goal. And how does your brain and mind even know the difference between what's useful uh, before you perceive it? Uh, so that's an important question that perceptual and attention psychologists have wrestled with for a long time. It's one thing to say that um, information is useful because it helps you achieve a goal. Uh, but how do you know it's going to help you achieve a goal until you've processed it? Uh, so there's the sort of catch-22 or there's sort of the conundrum uh, is you don't know something's useful until you've processed it. Uh, so how do you let it in to process it before you know it's useful? Uh, meaning that you either have to process everything to decide it's useful, or you have to have some kind of computational mechanism to let things in that might be useful based on how your cognitive system has evolved. Does that seem clear so far? If this were in person, you would nod your head. Uh, I'm just going to imagine that you nod your head. But if it ever, if I say, does this seem clear so far? And for, oh, good, thank you for the thumbs up. That's terrific. Um, if it ever doesn't seem clear, uh, by all means, post something in the chat and say, that did not seem clear. And I will stop uh, and try to explain it in a different way. So I'm already liking this uh, live uh, session a little bit better than just sitting here and recording them. Um, so there's a lot of sources of information. Um, so let's, let's, let's think a little bit, and I'm not going to ask you to necessarily say these things, though you can in the chat. Uh, what, are some, what are some of the sources of what's going on right now? So I look around. Um, I've got a lot of different things to pay attention to. So I've got the screen in front of me, and these PowerPoint slides are really just kind of like my notes to remind me what I want to talk about. I also see myself over there in the right-hand corner, uh, which I try not to get distracted by, but uh, for reasons that are beyond sort of the scope of this class, uh, all people and all primates, um, monkeys and apes do this as well, uh, can't resist looking at themselves in the mirror. One of the biggest challenges I've had with Zoom meetings is that no matter how many people I'm talking to, and this is different because this is a lecture, but if I'm doing a meeting with like nine people, uh, let's say a faculty meeting or a department meeting or um, maybe a, a PhD committee meeting, I spend almost all the time looking over at my own picture. And like, I already know what I look like. This is so stupid that I would keep doing it, but I can't help myself. I just keep looking at the picture that's me. Uh, so that's not very useful. It's going on. I've got to learn how to get, how to uh, you know, not pay attention to it. It's not relevant to the discussion, but there's a light over here. Uh, my phone sometimes buzzes. Uh, you can't see it right now from the uh, picture, but there's, uh, Maybe you can see it. Uh, there's a cat right down there, uh, and she's sleeping there. Um, as you can see, this is a converted bedroom, uh, and it's sort of in the upstairs part of my house, which has four bedrooms upstairs. Uh, and this happens to be the farthest from the furnace. Uh, so it gets a little cold sometimes. So I've got a little one of these little oil-filled heaters right here. Um, so because the heater is sort of generating a little bit of heat, automatically it attracts the cat because the cat is kind of like a heat-seeking missile. Uh, she's kind of like a very slow moving heat-seeking missile. Uh, so she's gonna sleep right down there for about another hour, at which point she'll probably get up uh, and then you know come over here and bother me while I'm doing the lecture. But anyway, you can't see it. There's a cat back there. I've got to try to ignore that. Um, I've also got, uh, 
you know, I'm, I'm near a window. You can't, obviously you can't see the window, but the window is directly to my uh, left. Uh, people might walk by with their dog if the window is open and I'm going to hear that. So there's all sorts of information going on. Some of it's important. Uh, I've got, um, there's four of us living in the house. My wife works at Western. Uh, one of my daughters is grade 11. Also, she's doing online school. Uh, one of my other daughters is a uh, second year uh, Western student. Uh, so she's doing online school. So all of us are doing, uh, you know, educational related stuff online. Uh, but also people are making coffee for themselves, making breakfast, uh, going downstairs stairs to work out, all sorts of stuff. Um, so one of you mentions uh, visual and auditory. So all of these things uh, are sources of information. The cat's name is Peppermint, by the way. Uh, she's about 12. Um, and I think we must have uh, gotten the cat um, maybe 12 or 13 Christmases ago and just decided to name her Peppermint. Uh, she doesn't look at all like a Peppermint, uh, but uh, she's, yeah, she's kind of middle, middle-aged, um, very slow moving. Uh, She's been, uh, since I have been working at home since March of 2020, it's hard to believe that long. Um, I thought the cat was going to kind of get tired of us being around all day. But honestly, I think it's the greatest thing that's ever, from her perspective, it seems like this has been the greatest year of her life. Uh, she's had four people to hang around and bother uh, in multiple little places to sleep. Uh, and there's always somebody nearby. So I think she actually kind of likes it. Um, and if and when we ever return to sort of working outside the house again, which let's, let's be honest, I hope we do, um, I, she, she's going to be really bored for a couple of hours, but oh, who knows, maybe somebody will be working from home all the time. Uh, so anyway, so only some of these are relevant. In fact, even right now, I've mentioned lots of irrelevant things. Uh, so this is what's known as computational complexity. Uh, the system that we exist in, uh, the system of the physical universe, uh, is much more complex uh, than we're able to perceive. So all of these things that I've mentioned are just pieces of information that we can perceive. Of course, there's lots of information we can't perceive. Uh, there's sounds that we can't hear, which still exist. Uh, there's light spectra, you know, infrared and ultraviolet light and those type of things that uh, we can't see, uh, but they still exist. Uh, there's different kinds of electromagnetic information, uh, temperature changes that maybe we can't perceive, but other species can. Uh, it's a complex world out there. What we've done as humans and what other organisms have all done is that we've evolved in a way that we can perceive some of it. Uh, and that effectively deals with uh, being able to eliminate a lot of the stuff that just can't matter for us. So what matters for us is visual and auditory stimulation. Uh, what matters to a dog, for example, is stuff that they can smell. I mean, sight and sound also matter to a dog, but dogs have a much more refined olfactory system. So lots of things matter to dogs that don't matter to us. Uh, things probably matter to my cat that doesn't matter to me. Um, but even within the universe of sounds and sights and experiences that we can perceive, there's more than we can take in at any one moment. Uh, so we have to have evolved or uh, come up with strategies so that we can eliminate or deal with this issue of computational complexity, uh, trying to perceive everything that's in front of us uh, with full attention uh, would be intractable and impossible. So we've come up with some ways uh, as humans, as computational cognitive systems uh, to deal with this. Uh, there's too much information. Uh, to perceive all at once. The complexity of that information uh, may be too great to manage all simultaneously. Uh, and so there's a couple of ways in which our cognitive systems try to get by. Uh, one of these, which I'll talk a lot more about in subsequent lectures, uh, is a general strategy called satisficing. Uh, now, satisficing is, uh, was coined by a computer scientist, Herb Simon, uh, in the late 1950s. Um, and the idea is that when humans are doing complex things like making decisions or solving problems or making plans and trying to achieve goals, um, that we adopt a strategy that assumes that we can't always get it right, uh, that sometimes we're going to make a mistake. Uh, a satisficing approach can be contrasted with a maximizer approach. Maximizing means uh, that when you're doing something, you try to be a perfectionist. You try to achieve the most possible. 
Uh, you try to win as many things as you can. You try to achieve as many goals as you can. And you will spend, um, how do we spell the method mentioned? Uh, So do you mean the method of satisfy? Oh, it's on the slide, yes. Uh, so if you're watching along on the slides, um, and if you're watching along, uh, you can all see my slides, is that right? Um, so yes, uh, okay, good. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks for the direct feedback. This could be going on for hours and I wouldn't even, <laughs> wouldn't even know. So yes, yeah, satisficing. Uh, and I'll have more to say about this when we talk about problem solving much later in the term. But satisficing is an approach I'd like to bring up early because um, I think it's useful from a well-being perspective. It's just impossible to achieve all of your goals. Uh, and sometimes you can figure out alternative ways to achieve most of your goals. Um, it's misspelled on the slide. Uh, it is supposed to say satisficing and not satisficing. So yes, I've literally misspelled this on my slide. Um, it's supposed to say, uh, maybe I should correct it now, shouldn't I? Um, let's go ahead and do that since we're sort of in a, uh, how do I get out of this? All right, let's correct this now. Um, I do uh, misspell things in the slide. Um, if we were doing this in person, of course, uh, you would all point out that it's misspelled. And I would say, I'll go ahead and fix that before I upload it. And then of course I would forget to fix it. Um, sat Tis. There's sat is ficing. There we go. Satisficing. It's a combination or portmanteau of the word satisfy um, and to satisfy constraints. So satisficing. Satisficing means that you set a criteria, uh, something that you would like to have to achieve your goal. Uh, and then you choose an alternative that seems to satisfy the goal whichever alternative or whichever uh, uh, solution seems to satisfy your goal first, you choose that alternative. One of the examples I use when I talk about problem solving and satisficing, which we'll do later in the class. Um, so those of you that pointed this out, thanks. If there's any errors in the slides, uh, since you know I'm just kind of doing this on the fly, uh, just let me know and I'll change them right, uh, right here. Uh, there's no sense uh, waiting till later. Um, so satisficing, uh, an example is, uh, suppose you're the hiring manager uh, at a, a grocery store uh, and you need to hire somebody, you have an advertisement out, you need to hire somebody who's gonna work in the front end of your grocery store and they're gonna put the groceries in bags. Uh, so one person's gonna do the checkout uh, and then there's another person who works to do the bagging to make it really quickly, um, you know, to, to help people check out really quickly. Um, what are the criteria you need to hire somebody to bag groceries? Well, they gotta show up. Uh, and they have to uh, be able to put things in a bag. Uh, that's pretty much it. Um, there are probably people who could do it better than others. Uh, and if you had 100 people who applied for the position, uh, you could interview all 100 of them. Uh, and then you could select based on maybe a skills test, which one of those 100 was the absolute best person. Uh, they were the most reliable, they were the fastest bagger, they were the most efficient, they could fit more things in a bag than anyone else, uh, which would be great for you as the store owner because you would use fewer bags. Um, and you could get more people through quickly. So that would be great, but it would also take a long time to interview and test 100 people to see who was the best uh, grocery bagger. Uh, it might be a better approach to say, as soon as you interview someone, the first person you interview who can demonstrate that they would show up and take instruction. Uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, so you would not interview all 100 and then select the maximal person, select the perfect person. You would set a goal and if you did something that achieved uh, that criterion, in other words, they can show up, they can bag groceries, that's it. Uh, we'll go, go ahead with that. Uh, that saves you a lot of time, saves you a lot of cognitive effort. Satisficing is an example of a broader category of things that we're gonna call heuristics. Uh, and one of the main heuristics that we use in cognition is our memory. Uh, any kind of heuristics, and we're gonna talk about heuristics when we talk about memory. We're gonna talk about heuristics when I talk about problem solving and decision-making. Uh, heuristics are sometimes also known as cognitive biases. Um, 
But that's sometimes a, a misnomer because a bias means that you're sometimes, kind of gives the idea that you're doing something wrong. A heuristic is a cognitive shortcut. Uh, and by that, I mean, it's a way to use your existing knowledge to make a decision or to solve a problem or to plan a behavior uh, without having to go through all of the possible alternatives. In other words, a heuristic is like this satisfying example. Rather than interviewing all 100 people and considering all of the examples, uh, you consider only a few examples and you choose the one that seems to be best. Uh, and we're gonna talk about a lot of different kinds of heuristics. But I wanna introduce the idea of heuristics now uh, because I wanna talk about how we use our memory uh, to make decisions. So people rely, all of us, on past experiences. Animals rely on past experiences. Uh, we all rely on past experiences to make decisions, but which ones? Uh, so that's one of the biggest questions in cognitive psychology. One of the biggest questions in cognition and cognitive science is, how do we pick our prior experiences to help us guide our future behavior? So how do you control your memory to recall the useful information? Uh, because whether you want to or not, your memory is going to be activated. Uh, you know, when you, even in this lecture, for example, uh, there might be things that you're familiar with. Maybe you've uh, heard the term satisficing before, or maybe you've thought before about some of these uh, issues of using past experience. That's going to automatically trigger uh, something else. Um, just talking about my cat. Uh, maybe you also have a cat, and that's going to trigger your own memories about cats. Uh, or maybe you have a dog that interferes or in, interferes with you while you're on a Zoom lecture. Uh, so maybe that's also something that you remember. Uh, a lot of these memories are activated automatically. Uh, we're going to later in lecture, we're going to call this spreading activation. So information you perceive spreads to other concepts and other areas of your memory, and it helps you recall those things. And it's usually based on how similar those things are. In general, memory for prior events can be used to guide decisions uh, about the present. Um, and I'm going to mention this now, I'm going to mention this later. I think this is one of the reasons why a lot of us, and I can, I'm speaking now from the perspective of a professor, but I think this is probably true of your uh, experiences as well. Adjusting to online school has been a challenge for a lot of us. It's been a challenge for me, um, and I suspect it's been a challenge uh, for you as well. And one of the reasons is most of you are second year students, right? Uh, some of you may be third year students, but I think the bulk of you are second year students because uh, it's a second year class. Uh, so uh, with the exception of last term and part of winter term, which would have been your first year, most of you had most of your class experience for your entire life from kindergarten on as classroom based, right? You go into a classroom and you kind of develop uh, concepts for how to behave, right? And I don't mean like to behaving like sitting still and listening. I just mean the general series of behaviors. You walk into a classroom, you find a seat, you sit down, you take your notes out. Uh, you expect to hear somebody in front of you talking. Um, it changes from when you're a primary school to a secondary school to university, but a lot of these things help you build your experiences. So since you were you know, five or six you know, for, for, a, for most of your life, uh, you've been working in classroom settings when you do educational stuff. Sure, you've transitioned from maybe using pencil uh, to using pen to using a laptop uh, and lots of different things. But for the most part, it's a slow transition, right? You went from uh, little classes to larger classes to larger classes to big lectures. And now all of a sudden, everybody was stuck home. <laughs> uh, so you're sitting in your bedroom or you're sitting in an office or you're sitting in your living room. Uh, and you're watching this on a video. And I'm doing the same thing uh, for my entire uh, university experience. So I think I mentioned this in the, um, did I mention this in the introductory lecture? Uh, so I started undergrad in 1988. Uh, so this is the longest I've been away from a campus. I've been working at home since uh, March of 2020. Uh, so this is the longest I've ever been away from a university campus uh, in, since, since the 1980s. Uh, so it's kind of weird uh, thinking about how, how, to, how to design a class and how to do a lecture. Um, so I think that a lot of us probably struggled, especially last term, and certainly uh, in you know, March and April of 2020, when we first all got sent home, just trying to figure out how to deal with this new way of uh, 
of learning uh, is a big challenge for all of us because we don't have a lot of prior memory for how to do it. Um, we don't have a lot of prior uh, conceptual experience uh, with online class. So it makes it a little bit harder. Um, now of course, you know why we're all home, uh, coronavirus and COVID-19. Now you've all seen graphs like this and I'm not trying to be grim, uh, but you know exactly where we are, right? We're here, uh, we're in this point where uh, everything's ticking up and I've just, tr I've just, um, I've left out a lot of the countries. Here's the United States, uh, you know, alone. Uh, in this is just, I'm just looking at the death rate here. This is terrible stuff. But um, so here's the United States alone uh, in its uh, high rate, but we're all following the same trajectory. So you see the United the UK uh, is also uh, showing a spike. Canada is down here, but they're also showing a spike. So you know we're sort of in the same. Uh, boat, right? You know where things are going. Uh, maybe some of you have uh, tested positive in the past and have recovered. Maybe family members of you have. I hope that none of you have experienced uh, any death in your, uh, uh, in your extended family. Uh, I have not yet. Uh, my own, uh, my dad was admitted to the hospital back in um, December. Uh, and he's like 75 and he's got uh, diabetes and some other comorbidities. He still lives in Pittsburgh. Uh, so he was admitted with COVID uh, back in December. Uh, and despite his age and his comorbidities, uh, he managed to survive. So he's back home and recovering. Uh, my sister-in-law, uh, maybe two cousins. So a lot of my extent, because most of my extended families in the US, uh, there's been quite a number of them who have tested positive uh, as far as I know. But um, so this is where we are. But here's where we were. There was a time, and this is March 1st. I've uh, pinged March 1st, 2020. This is before we all got sent home. And this, I'm not looking at cases, I'm just looking at deaths. And you can see that in the United States on March 1st, uh, the average, the rolling average was for the entire country, one. Uh, so there were not very many people dying. Uh, it existed, people knew about it. People knew about COVID. Uh, we all knew that it was something. And we've dealt with things like this before because um, the US and Canada dealt with Ebola few years ago. They dealt with SARS about uh, eight, uh, 15 or so years ago. Uh, they dealt, dealt with AIDS about 30 years ago. Uh, so pandemics have happened. Uh, and in prior uh, experiences, although they've been scary and many people have died, so when the AIDS crisis hit in the 1980s, uh, a lot of Americans died, a lot of Canadians died. Uh, SARS was initially a big uh, scare. Ebola is very uh, fatal when people catch it. Um, but in none of those cases had anything like this ever happened. Uh, so we just don't have experience with these kinds of things. Uh, we have some experience with pandemics, but we didn't have any idea in March that it was gonna look like this. So um, why do I bring this up? Uh, I bring this up because uh, on March 2nd, so one day after this uh, was shown when almost nobody was dying and there was still a lot of uncertainty about what happened. The mayor of New York City, uh, Bill de Blasio is the mayor of New York City still, um, sent out a tweet. Uh, and as you know, in the United States, uh, a lot of stuff happens on Twitter. Um, he sent out this tweet and he said, since I'm encouraging New Yorkers to go on with your lives and get out on the town despite coronavirus, can already see this sounds like terrible advice, right? In retrospect, this was really bad advice. But uh, Mayor de Blasio did not know this was really bad advice. Uh, he thought he would offer some suggestions and he's telling people what shows to go see. Uh, he's telling people to go see uh, Broadway musicals uh, in New York City at a time when uh, almost nobody was dying uh, and there were still a few cases. You know what happened next. Uh, here is uh, just one month later, uh, went from one death to 735 deaths a day uh, in the United States. And I'm sure you know, the bulk of those at that point were in New York City. Uh, so without realizing it, uh, Mayor de Blasio gave the worst possible advice to the people of New York City. It's a very dense city. Uh, most people take public transportation. Uh, people are crowded together. Apartment buildings are small. Uh, apartments are small. If you've never been to New York City, it's uh, like no other place uh, in the United States or in North America. So it's very big. It's very dense. 
uh, and it also experienced the worst uh, of the coronavirus early on uh, before people knew how to treat it and before people knew how to deal with it. And a lot of people uh, blamed, I'm going backwards here, blamed uh, Mayor de Blasio exactly for this. Why on earth in retrospect would he give this advice, which was clearly the wrong advice. Uh, and you know, it's, you, you, you can't blame him personally for all of this, uh, but it's pretty easy to show that if he hadn't encouraged people uh, I realize correlation and causation are not directly connected and he wasn't forcing anybody to go out, but you know, he's the mayor of the city and he's telling people, don't worry about it, go out and do, enjoy yourselves despite coronavirus, uh, don't let the virus get you down. It was the wrong advice to give. Where did he get this idea? Well, he got this idea, uh, this is my guess. Um, this is what I think if you understand a little bit about cognitive psychology and reliance on memory, he got this idea from a former mayor uh, 20 years ago, Mayor Giuliani. Uh, before Rudy Giuliani um, became the Rudy Giuliani that you see today uh, on Twitter and on the news, uh, he was a well-regarded mayor of New York City. And he happened to be the mayor of New York City uh, when uh, the September 11th attack uh, where the planes flew into the World Trade Center. Now, I know most of you were either not born or were uh, infants when this happened, uh, but you learned about this, right? So there's a popular Canadian musical, Come From Away, that's based around the idea of uh, planes being rerouted uh, when these two buildings collapsed. And you know that there were about 3,000 people who died uh, when those buildings collapsed, and it was a big trauma. I remember this because I was a postdoc at the time, um, and nothing like this had ever happened before in the United States. Uh, and a few weeks after it happened, so it happened on September 11th, 2001. Uh, this is a capture of an old CNN site. Look how crude the website was back in those days. Um, from September 30th, uh, Mayor Giuliani went on uh, Saturday Night Live and said in front of a live audience to the entire country and to New York, um, it's open for business. Don't let this get you down. Uh, we're trying to get as many people to go out to dinner as possible. We want you in shows. Uh, we want you to go, you know, come and see new, uh, Saturday Night Live, go and see Broadway shows, uh, go out and see concerts, go out and see, go out to your clubs. They wanted as many people as possible not to be afraid to go out. This was the right advice at the time because what caused uh, the September 11th attack uh, had been controlled, right? Initially, flights were grounded. Uh, they figured out who was responsible. Um, there was a dangerous area you know, downtown where the buildings were still burning and collapsing and everything, but the rest of the city was able to get on its business. Uh, so my guess, um, and I might, I'm not gonna try to claim that I'm the only person that thought of this, but in fact, I think I am the person who thought of this because I wrote this in my uh, book that's coming out. Uh, I made the connection uh, or described how this connection worked. So my guess is that Mayor de Blasio looked back. Uh, he was a he was living in New York City at the time and thought 20 years ago, September 11th, it was a big tragedy in New York. Mayor Giuliani went out, told everybody New York's open for business, uh, and it was a good advice. And it also was good for Giuliani. That's one of the reasons that he became as popular as he was as a mayor. Um, he's since sort of maybe fallen a little bit in many people's uh, eyes. Uh, but at the time, he was really well regarded for this. Here he is with Prime Minister uh, Jean Chrétien, uh, talking about uh, you know, the way in which the two countries are going to work together uh, to solve this crisis. Uh, so this was the right advice. And my guess is that um, de Blasio probably thought, you know, this is, when was the last time anybody had to deal with some big crisis in New York City of this kind? Uh, the advice they gave was go out and enjoy yourselves. And so he did the same thing, uh, but it was the wrong memory. You can see why he made the mistake. I mean, you can totally see why he would have said, uh, this is what you've got to do because this is what we do, right? You know, we encourage people to go out and not panic. We encourage them uh, to not uh, stress out about things and we encourage them uh, to do the right thing. Just wasn't the right advice uh, at the time. So you can see where he got the idea um, but it was, it, was, it was the wrong thing to say. Um, all right, so let's, let's talk a little bit about the history of psychology. I'm gonna talk about this, and then I think uh, seems like a pretty good time to take a short break, 
Um, by my estimation now, it is, uh, what time is it now? It's uh, 1040. So let's go through this historical approach. Are there any questions on uh, the use of memory uh, in that example? If there are, uh, just post them over in the chat and I can pause and get back to them. Uh, this historical approach is, uh, takes about 10 minutes to get through. Uh, do 10 minutes, we'll take maybe a five minute break, go get a drink, go refresh your coffee. I'll pause the recording um, and maybe turn off my video for a second. Uh, and then I'll just be right back to it. Uh, but we'll get to there. If I keep talking, uh, we're never gonna get through this. Um, the only reason I wanna cover history uh, and some of this you've probably covered in Psych 1000, is that it gives you a good idea about how cognitive psychology came to be and why it's designed the way it is. So there's certain aspects of the psychology, of certain aspects of cognitive psychology that developed over time. And the things, the way in which we try to investigate cognition can tell us a little bit about the kinds of questions that we can answer and the kind of conclusions that we can draw. So uh, until psychology and experimental psychology uh, came about, um, most of these things were the realm of uh, philosophy. Uh, so philosophers, and there are still lots of philosophers working in this area, um, thought about the contrast of the pool between nativism and empiricism. And you've heard about this before, right? People call it a nature versus nurture debate. How much of our uh, thoughts are uh, innate. So what are we born with and how much do we gain with experience? And you know, uh, as well as, I mean, we all can agree that this is a, uh, you know, it's not one or the other. Nobody believes that everything is innate. Nobody believes that everything is uh, designed over an experience. The problem or the challenge or the big question is trying to figure out how those two things interact, right? We might be able to say, uh, you know, we have our, our our brain develops in a specific way because of our DNA, right? So cells grow in certain ways and our uh, genes tell, you know, our genetic uh, background helps certain neurons develop in specific ways so that areas uh, of the brain can process auditory information, other areas of the brain can process visual information, other areas of the brain can selectively attend. And so, you know, our brain develops in a certain way. So that's kind of innate. Right, the way in which our brain develops and specializes, but you could also say that it developed that way because of external pressure from evolution. Uh, so it's never really very easy to figure out what we're born with and what has uh, evolved because of uh, external pressures. And of course, we pick up ideas and thoughts uh, over time, and even those develop over time. So we're not going to spend much time with this uh, other than just to say that there's always been this tension uh, between trying to figure out how much of what we have uh, is innate, how much of what we have uh, is uh, granted by our experiences, perceptual and conceptual, and uh, both. Um, however, uh, somewhere along the line, at the end of the 1800s, the beginning of the 1900s, experimental psychology uh, came around uh, by applying the scientific method to understanding thinking. Uh, and one of the things I want to talk about over the next uh, few minutes is the specific approach that was chosen at different times determines what kind of data are collected, what kinds of questions can be asked, and what kinds of conclusions can be drawn. Different areas of psychology uh, choose different approaches, and that means they can answer things in different ways. So early on, uh, at the end of the 1800s, Wilhelm Wundt, uh, you learned all of this in Psych 1000, I'm sure, uh, studied cognitive processes by looking inward. Uh, and we kind of did a little bit of that at the beginning of the class, right? Um, where uh, I suggested that, you know, you look around you and think about all of the different uh, stimuli that you have, auditory stimuli, visual stimuli, uh, all of those different things that might be competing for your attention. To some degree, that's a, that's a type of introspection, trying to think about how you uh, understand things and how you perceive things. Uh, and in this case, most experimenters would be asked uh, to introspect and collect thoughts from others. Uh, but as you might imagine, it's not very reliable across labs because people have different ways of describing their experiences. And of course, as we've already discussed, we've evolved and designed ways to ignore things. Uh, so, uh, you know, we're used to ignoring stuff. It takes a lot of time to not ignore unconscious influences. And it's just inappropriate for lots of things. I mean, uh, it's difficult to be able to introspect how you 
uh, perceive letters or how you recognize objects or how you deploy attention or how things capture your attention. Uh, you can get close if you are mindful, uh, but it's very difficult to do uh, scientifically. Uh, and so that was interesting to people, but it still seemed more philosophical. Uh, William James also uh, was interested in understanding and explaining uh, experiences, but was less interested in the structure of thought and more interested in what it does. So James called his approach uh, functionalism. So why do we do the things that we do? Not how do we do them, but why do we do them? Uh, but this is still a non-scientific approach. Um, you've also read about Gestalt psychologists, and Gestalt psychologists also from the early 20th century were interested in understanding rules by which humans perceive and parse the world into features. That's important because uh, later on when we talk about perception and object recognition, we want to talk about some of the basic elements of object perception. So for example, you've seen these kinds of things in Psych 1000. Uh, we perceive these objects here as circles and rectangles and not as a series of dashed lines because we fill in the blanks. Uh, our mind uh, defaults to understanding these whole objects and we just assume uh, that there's a continuation. So we assume that lines that are in the same direction will close. We assume that things can be perceived uh, by similarity function or by proximity. Uh, so we perceive this column of two dots, this, these lines here of circles, we perceive them as a column and another column and another column. Uh, we perceive this as a square. Uh, and so a lot of what we perceive has to do with the way in which these objects activate primary visual process. We're going to talk about that in two weeks when we talk about uh, visual perception and object recognition. This was an early attempt to understand cognitive psychology, but still relatively non-scientific. In other words, we didn't know how to measure things. We didn't have a standard of measurement. Uh, Gestalt psychologists hadn't yet thought about how to approach this scientifically. They're still asking people uh, to reflect on their experiences. They're getting close uh, to science, but they're not quite there yet. So up to this point, psychology had ideas, some theories, and good intuitions, but they did not have a scientific method, and that came later with the science of behaviorism, which we don't include in cognitive psychology uh, specifically, but a lot of the things that behaviorists uh, discovered, a lot of their approaches and a lot of their discoveries, uh, we will continue to use when we talk about learning and when we talk about the way neurons communicate with each other and we talk about the way uh, people generalize. Those were discovered first by behaviorists. Uh, and you've also read about this in Psych 1000. Uh, people like John Watson on the top and B.F. Skinner at the bottom were interested in understanding the connection between the outside world of stimuli, so things that are in the physical universe, with behavior without having to worry about how people thought about them. Uh, so that doesn't mean that all behaviorists, uh, did, you know, they didn't ignore thought, but they just weren't able to study it. Uh, you can study inputs and outputs, but you can't study thinking scientifically. That was their, uh, that was sort of their approach. So what can you observe? You can observe stimuli, which are inputs. You can observe behaviors, which are outputs. But constructs for internal states, like your feelings or your intentions or your desires or your goals, we just can't observe that or measure it. So that's really the more important thing. We can't measure it. And certainly, well, we can now to some degree, we can measure things more precisely with reaction time and uh, brain imaging techniques, which we'll talk about next week. We can uh, observe those things in a much better way now. But at the time in the um, early middle 20th century, those types of things simply couldn't be measured. And so behaviorists argued that they should be taken off the table for a little while. In other words, uh, try to understand human behavior from a stimulus to response uh, mechanism. Uh, try to understand human behavior from how they respond to things rather than trying to understand uh, human behavior from desires and goals. These associations between a stimulus and a response uh, would be how you try to explain behavior. Um, but this also ran into limitations, just like functionalism and structuralism ran into limitations early on, behaviorism also ran into limitations early on because it seemed like it was not answering a full question. Uh, so yes, there's lots of work you can do with trying to understand the difference between a stimulus and a response. 
Um, but there's a lot going on beyond that. And there's a great experiment I'm going to talk a little bit more about. I'm going to go into some more detail and then we'll wrap things up for a quick break here. Um, was by a psychologist named Tinkelbaugh in the uh, early uh, 20th century, 1928. Um, Tinkelpaw was interested in something that behaviorists called delayed response. So delayed response is what we might call a proxy for memory. Uh, so being able to observe something, go away, come back to it, and then act as if uh, you remember, but without having to think about what the nature of a memory representation would be, uh, it's just a delayed response. Here's how they set up the experiment. Uh, monkeys uh, were looking for lettuce or bananas. Uh, and these would be hidden under several cups. Uh, and memory in this case would be operationally defined as finding the food and eating it. So you can imagine how this would happen if you took some cups, put a little slice of banana under one of them, mix them up like this, and then ask the monkey where they're gonna be. The monkey's gonna pull up the one that had the banana and they're gonna eat the banana. That shows that they were able to track something uh, and respond to it. Um, in this case, getting the food reinforces the behavior. Okay, so this is fairly straightforward. Um, but in some cases, and I'll show you their uh, results on the next page, but uh, in a lot of cases, they did the experiment in such a way that uh, a banana would be hidden, the monkey would leave, and while the monkey could not see what was happening, they would take the banana away and put lettuce in the same place, okay? Um, and then the monkey would come back in, you know, probably strut back in thinking like, uh, I'm going to get my banana now pick up the cup and there would be like a lettuce leaf there. And they're like, what the heck? You know, there was a banana there before. I don't understand why you're giving me this lettuce. And it's not that I don't like lettuce. It's just that I was kind of hoping for a banana. You could certainly imagine how that would feel if somebody said uh, that, they, you know, they're giving you something uh, and then you get something that's not so good, right? You think like, what the heck? I was promised something better. Um, you probably felt that way when you enrolled uh, for classes in the spring last year. You're like, Western says it's going to have some of its classes in person. Uh, and then they come back to you and they say, everything's online. And you're like, what the heck? I wanted, uh, I wanted a real lecture. Um, so anyway, that's what the monkey was doing. The monkey was kind of like irritated. Uh, and the researchers speculated about this. They, they didn't want to admit that the monkey had feelings, right? Because nobody wants to admit that, certainly not in the behaviorist days. But clearly the monkey was acting as if it was not happy with what had happened. Um, here's how they describe it. So here's the original paper, Otto Leif Tinkelpaw from Yale University. Um, and here's the setup. Uh, they, uh, they've got a cage. Uh, they have um, a specific uh, you know, ways in which uh, these tin cups with ropes. So the monkey comes up and it pulls uh, the tin cup that it wants, right? So they didn't really try to interact closely with the monkey. The monkey was always in a cage. Um, I've only highlighted this here because every time I read this, it makes me laugh. Uh, the monkey was fed his usual ration of grain and after eating it, he retired to the sleeping quarters for the night. Um, I wish people would write like that on psychology papers now. Um, okay, so the monkey gets some grain, retires for the night, uh, and then comes back. Um, and as it says here, uh, I got a question here. Yes, I will get to this. So the behavior, uh, but isn't behavior mostly reinforced by desires? How could they not want to think about the subjectivity of the feelings? This explains, um, the reason this is an interesting paper is this reflects sort of the uh, conflict in psychology at the time. The, researchers did not want to think about the monkey having uh, desires. They wanted to think about the monkey as solely uh, responding to stimuli. Uh, and so that uh, lettuce would still be a reward. All it's being asked to do is uh, find a cup that has the food in it uh, and get some reward. It doesn't have to be the same reward. Um, and so if it's just a stimulus response machine, uh, it should still be able to remember where the food had been, uh, even if the food isn't there anymore. Um, and says the third part of the experiment consisted in sub whoops, consisted in substituting foods. The animal was shown a piece of banana, but at the moment of covering up the food, lettuce was substituted. So they got the banana, put it in, lettuce goes in. The animal had in experiments before eaten lettuce with apparent relish. Uh, and was still hungry. Um, and apparent relish obviously means 
that like they were really happy. They relished the experience. And I don't mean that they put like relish on top of the um, lettuce. So uh, all they're saying is the monkey had eaten lettuce before and was really pleased with it. Following the delay, the animal rushed to the proper side, lifted the cup in the ordinary manner, but instead of grasping the lettuce, he showed marked hesitation. He looked all about the floor uh, in close vicinity, looked in the cup, and you can sort of just imagine the monkey. He picks up like this, and he's like, you know, sort of doing this kind of thing. Like, what do you? Um, you've all seen that meme, right? Where the uh, guy is a monkey watching the guy, and he makes the thing disappear, and then the monkey's like, does that kind of surprise face. That's totally what the monkey was doing here. Um, you would, this would have been a meme uh, if it would have not been in the 1920s. Uh, he looked all about the floor in close vicinity, looked at the cup, which was held in the left hand, looked at the other cup and at the experimenters. You can sort of imagine what the monkey's doing. Um, uh, and they couldn't figure this out. The psychologists were having a tough time figuring this out because it didn't fit with behaviorism. This, it seems to the writer, that is to say the scientist, suggests that the monkey's behavior in the other substitution tests where lettuce was substituted for banana was indicative of disappointment. Uh, there must have been surprise on either occasion, but this was not discernible in the subject's behavior. So they almost want to say uh, that these monkeys um, were disappointed. They had an internal state. Uh, they were, there was something about them that recognized that they were getting cheated. Uh, and although behaviorism was having a difficult time explaining being cheated, uh, clearly these researchers were noticing that it was kind of hard to explain it otherwise. So that was one example, but there were lots of examples. Behaviorism was a very rigorous scientific approach, but it was just limited in the things that it could understand. It couldn't understand things like disappointment. Um, it didn't understand things like how humans acquire language. Um, Skinner, B.F. Skinner had argued in the 1950s that children can learn language mostly by imitation and reinforcement. Uh, so you know, children hear their parents talk and they pick that up and they're reinforced for saying the correct things. Uh, Noam Chomsky, a few years later, questioned whether or not this could work um, and pointed out that children say all sorts of things that they never could have heard. Uh, and they say things that are incorrect, but seem to suggest that they're following some kind of innate rule structure. And so Chomsky argued that behaviorism is simply unable to explain these kinds of complex behaviors. It does work for what it's supposed to explain, but it isn't sufficient for explaining the whole range of human cognition. Um, and so this began in the 1950s, late 1950s and early 1950s, a period of psychology which is known as the cognitive revolution. Uh, now that sounds like really a big deal, but the reason it's often referred to as a revolution um, is that it was a very short turnaround time from excluding any kind of uh, investigations of uh, internal mental states to primarily investigating internal mental states. And it was a period in the 1960s when people might have started graduate school, earning a PhD, studying uh, laws of reinforcement and behaviorism, and then emerged from their PhD studying uh, memory, attention, uh, perception, uh, goals, motivations, and all the sorts of things that we think about as being part of psychology now. And so it's a very short turnaround time where at the beginning of the 1960s and the late 1950s, everybody in experimental psychology was studying behaviorism. And by the end of the 1960s, most people were studying cognitive psychology or social cognition. So psychologists began to study thinking and memory and internal states. Uh, one of the main reasons for this uh, is that in the 1950s and the 1940s, um, digital computers uh, became available. Uh, and this picture here on the right-hand side, you've probably seen something like this. Um, this would have been uh, one of the earliest computers. This is the ENIAC computer at the University of Illinois, or sorry, University of Pennsylvania. And you can see that it's the size of a room. And so instead of you know, a microchip uh, or tiny little processor, uh, people had to literally switch uh, cables back and forth. So it worked in a really slow way, but it also provided uh, psychologists with sort of a metaphor for studying the mind. Computers have inputs and outputs, right? Uh, but they also have an internal physical state. You don't think about that very much anymore when you're thinking about the computer that's in your iPhone. 
Um, but you do think about it, or you could see it in one of these older computers. You've got input, so you feed instructions to the computer. It does some computations, it gives you output. But in the meantime, you can actually observe the internal state, which switches are on, which switches are off. Uh, and what psychologists started doing was approaching the study of the mind in the same way. You've got inputs, you've got outputs, that's behaviorism, but there has to be some way to study the internal information processing states. If you can do it in a computer, you can also do it in a mind. The most current uh, iteration of this is cognitive neuroscience. Uh, that's next week's lecture. Uh, but cognitive neuroscience takes what was discovered in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, and through the 90s as cognitive psychology, and then tries to move down a level to the brain. Uh, so we know that the brain can carry out cognitive processes. We know that it does computations. How does the brain do this? Uh, so how do neurons work together? How do different clusters of neurons work together to perceive objects and to feed information to one area to the brain, uh, from one area of the brain to the other area of the brain? How does activation spread across concepts and areas? Um, next week, um, we're gonna talk about how you can measure this. Uh, so this, uh, so that I'm gonna, so I'm not mentioning any more about this now because I've got a whole lecture for this next week. Um, so looking at my clock now, uh, it's about 11 o'clock. Um, I do wanna continue on with this uh, discussion here of cognition in the classroom. Uh, but I feel like this would be a really good time for me to stop talking uh, for just a bit uh, and to take a very short break. So I'm going to go refresh uh, my coffee um, and uh, I, don't know, I don't know, get a snack or something, but let's just say five minutes. I'm literally just going to turn this off for five minutes. I imagine most of you are probably watching this in your home, uh, whether it's in a bedroom or a, a living room or a home office or something like that. Uh, so this probably isn't very far you're going. Um, so it's only going to be a minute or two. So let's say about five minutes, uh, we'll sort of regroup and I'll go through the other half. If you feel like you've had enough and you leave, uh, I don't mind if the participant count goes down, uh, but hopefully you'll stick around because there's some really interesting stuff. But before you go, um, during the break, I'm going to give you one thing to do. Uh, so I hope none of you go, uh, but before you go, I'm going to give you one brief thing. I'm going to post a quick, uh, survey here that I want you to do. There's two questions and we're going to talk about this. So we're going to look at the data uh, live as we go. So I'm going to paste this over into the um, chat window. Uh, go to that survey uh, and answer the questions. And we're going to look at some of the responses uh, when we get back. Uh, so it's 11 o'clock, let's say about 11.03. How does that sound? Uh, that'll give us just enough time to finish up uh, without having to uh, uh, without having to go too far. And I think we'll probably finish everything about 1130 or so. Okay, I'm going to turn my video off. I'll see you on a few minutes. Uh, take a few minutes to just answer those two questions, and then we'll look at them really quickly, uh, and then we'll finish things up.
Okay. Um, oh, good. I see most of you are still here. That's terrific. Um, and just for those of you that are watching that aren't, well, actually for everybody, uh, you know, you know, this is not a mandatory uh, lecture. All of this is going to be uploaded. Um, there's no particular reason uh, that you need to show up. I do hope that as many of you can as possible. I think it's a good, uh, it's certainly a good way to, um, you know, sort of feel like you're part of the class. Uh, that's one of the things I noticed last year uh, in my uh, other course. Uh, and it's one of the things that I've heard from a lot of other students is that uh, when everything is online, it's kind of hard to really uh, feel like you're part of a class uh, because you can watch it at different times and uh, you know things just kind of bleed into each other. And you know, you've got three or four different classes all kind of doing similar things. And it's, it's kind of hard to sort of feel like one class is separate from the other. So this is one potentially good way to maybe feel a little bit more like we're all together working on this. But Okay, so uh, we're back here, and I've got some responses to look at, uh, but first I want to, um, if you haven't answered that uh, quiz, uh, now would be a perfect time to do it. We'll look at that in a bit. I've also got a, um, looks like something on the chat over here. Um, okay, good, you're having discussions amongst yourself. Uh, as always, that's my. Uh, so I hope things are going to work. Uh, um, if you've got other questions, certainly uh, uh, just flag me over there, and I'll try to get to them. Oh, is my screen is sharing? So you can all see this. Let's pick back up from where we were. Um, okay, so cognition in the classroom or at home. Um, I used to give this lecture in a classroom. And this is what it kind of looked like. This is not a Western classroom. First of all, how many of you panic when you see this? Like they're way too close to each other. They're not wearing masks. Uh, I cannot believe this is how people used to exist. Uh, this is just something I got from a Google image search. Um, but you've all experienced this, right? This is like a first year psychology class or a first year bio class or something like that. And when I first saw this picture, when I was re re you know, reviewing my lectures, I was like, oh my God, that is a super spreader event right there. Uh, I don't really miss that. I wouldn't actually want to be that close to somebody uh, in a lecture anyway, but you can see why, you can see why we're home. Uh, this is clearly not, uh, this would be a bad idea now, but this is how people used to, uh, so people used to learn. And what do you notice the most about this? You notice that they're all sitting there on a laptop, mostly Apple laptops. This is not an Apple advertisement. It just happens to be the way it is. Uh, so some people have, uh, you know, uh, Microsoft uh, or Surface Pros or uh, Dell computers, but there's a lot of Apple MacBooks along here. So this is how most of us uh, work, right? We sit at a laptop and we take notes during a class. Uh, this is how probably you're watching this on a laptop. Um, so that's one of the first things that uh, I've noticed uh, over the last few years is how many more people are working on laptops. Um, Kitty, gonna go down. Kitty's on my lap now, unfortunately. This is how it looks now. Um, this again is not you. This is just a screen capture, a Google image search uh, that I did of uh, you know Zoom class. Uh, so it's a really different environment. So some of the stuff that I say is not exactly going to be uh, you know doesn't pertain. Uh, this is what it looks like now. I'm not viewing any of you. Actually, all of you have your cameras off. But uh, you know this is this is what we were used to. Uh, this is what we're doing now. Um, and uh, one of the issues uh, that we have to deal with is uh, a lot of these digital distractions. So whether you are this, uh, this, which means that you have your computer in front of you, uh, which means that if you're watching this on Zoom, you probably also have Teams open, but you also have uh, a browser window open. And most of you probably also have your uh, iPhone uh, or your smartphone on your table, um, which also has uh, notifications popping up, like these students here. Uh, again, you can see why high school students are not in person too, because look how close they're sitting without masks. Uh, just everything that we did in the educational system uh, was not really set up uh, to work with something like COVID. So here's some students sharing a laptop, probably doing some kind of, um, what's the name of that online quiz that uh, quiz platform that students use a lot. Well, they're probably doing something like that. They're probably accessing or answering something on their device uh, in the middle of class. So these can be useful educationally, but they can also be distractions. 
Um, and this is a paper that came out a few years ago that I've talked about in other classes, but I think it's really good uh, to bring to your attention. Um, and it's not the final answer, by the way, it's not the final word on this, uh, but some research has found that when you work uh, with your smartphone nearby, which let's be honest, all of us have, um, that it can sometimes be a distraction. Uh, and Adrian Ward uh, set out to find out whether or not that was gonna be the case. Uh, and so they had a fairly large sample size, uh, so 500 students, uh, 500 subjects, and they put them into one of three conditions. Uh, in one condition, this is a psychological experiment, so they're going to be brought into a lab uh, and asked to answer some questions and do some cognitive tasks. So participants in the other room condition, when they entered the psychology lab, uh, they left all of their belongings in the lobby and then entered the testing room, which would be very typical of how uh, we would run experiments in my lab. Uh, so, you know, experimenter would meet you, you'd sign your consent form, and then you might leave your bag here <clears throat> and you would go on to uh, study, do the study in a different room, okay? Uh, so that's the other room. So not only all your belongings, but your phone stays out here. Uh, on the desk condition, they left their belongings, but they were asked to bring their smartphone and put it face down in front of them uh, with notifications off, uh, sounds off while they were doing the task. And then the, the pocket and bag condition, uh, they were asked to just keep their phone where they normally would keep it. Uh, so for some of us, that's in the pocket. Uh, for other people, that might be in their uh, bag or something like that. Um, and then they were asked to do a series of cognitive experiments. Uh, so uh, one of these is called the operation span task, where you have to uh, keep track of uh, letters uh, while you're doing some mental math. So it's, a, it's kind of a working memory executive functioning task, and it requires a lot of attention, and it requires a lot of memory. Um, Raven's progressive matrices, uh, which is a test of fluid intelligence, so it's kind of a puzzle uh, problem-solving test. And what they were interested in uh, is that some of these things, especially this O-SPAN task, which as you can see down here, uh, assesses domain general attentional resources available to the individual at a moment to moment basis. Um, so in other words, if you're distracted briefly by something, uh, which, you know, for example, uh, while I'm giving this lecture, as you can see probably in the background, uh, my cat is now up and, up and around, uh, and at some point she's gonna distract me. If I'm distracted briefly by my cat and I was trying to do something that required a lot of attention, my performance is gonna suffer. So the cat is kind of like a brain drain. Your phone could be a brain drain as well. And what they discovered was that for working memory capacity, the O-SPAN task, and for fluid intelligence, the Raven's progressive matrices task, that when subjects had their phone, even with notification sounds off, face down on the desk, they were performing worse than participants who left their phone in the other room. Uh, and participants in this pocket bag condition were usually in the middle. And so what they concluded was that sometimes just being near your phone is enough to momentarily distract you. Um, and so it's a challenge, whether it's in a classroom setting or in a home setting. Uh, one of the things that makes it hard to pay attention to a class is that lots of things going on. Uh, now, when we were in a classroom, uh, that was the main thing that I would talk about. Your laptop is a distraction or your phone is a distraction. I mean, you've probably got a lot more distractions going on now, right? Uh, many of you in that first survey indicated that, um, you know, you might be living at home with siblings, right? So that might mean that people have different classes and different schedules. Uh, or you might be living with other students who are doing different classes. And maybe one of them is uh, you know, making a smoothie in the kitchen while you're trying to study uh, or while you're listening to a lecture, right? So there's lots of, there are a lot of other distractions. Maybe you have a pet. Uh, whether it's a dog or a cat or two cats or something like that. Or maybe you have your own children and you're looking after them because they're uh, home uh, doing school online. Or maybe you have younger siblings who are in elementary or high school. Uh, a lot of distractions. But even little things like just having your phone can be a distraction. See, she's, now she's trying to open the door up. So she's going to sort of pick over there for a while. At some point, I might have to get up uh, and let her out which is gonna be annoying, but I'm just gonna to try to ignore it right now. Um, okay, so that was point number one. And, and the general purpose advice is, uh, no, I'm not letting you out, is to try to um, ignore some of those distractions. What is it that you want? 
I'm in the middle. I'm in the middle of something. Um, so second issue, and this is what I, uh, the survey that I asked uh, you to do, we'll come back to the survey that I asked you to do, um, was a study that came out uh, in uh, 2014, arguing that people who take notes by hand uh, are, do a little bit better when they have to remember things than people who take notes by typing them. Um, and this is something that's really interesting to me uh, because it doesn't always, it isn't, it isn't always true, but it's sometimes true. But when this paper first came out, it made a big splash and people, to the point where people would want to pan laptops from class because they felt that students weren't able to uh, take notes properly. So let's talk a little bit about that. First of all, it's a relatively low powered study, uh, meaning that the sample size was fairly small. Uh, but what they asked subjects to do was something like what we're doing now, which is they watched a TED talk. And really this lecture is not a TED talk, but it's kind of like a TED talk. So it's a person talking about a topic that you're kind of interested in and you're taking notes. And what they found, uh, first of all, was that performance, um, I've got these in the wrong order, sorry. Uh, let's, I'll, I'll reverse these later. No, actually, I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna reverse these right now because I've got uh, this slide supposed to come first. Let's go back to right where we were, how about that? Um, so what they found, uh, two things. First of all, um, across the studies that they did, people who used a laptop, which is how most of us take notes in a lecture hall, uh, wrote more things. Uh, so they just tended to write more. If they were taking notes on OneNote or Evernote or write on the PowerPoint slide, which is I think what a lot of you do, um, and that's what I would do. Uh, they wrote more words. So this slide here shows you um, that, um, do I have a uh, laser pointer here? So it looks like I've got a laser pointer here. Um, so this is showing you that uh, they wrote significantly more words, significantly more words, significantly more words when they had, uh, when they were able to type things. Hold on for a second. I have to deal with this. It's gonna annoy me. Anyone else? A lot better when she was just kind of sitting there. But um, secondly, they found that there was more verbatim overlap. Uh, in other words, uh, what students wrote tended to be exactly what was being said. Uh, so if you're taking notes by typing it, you would write what students note was exact wrote was exactly what they said. So they tended to transcribe exactly what the speaker was saying. I mean, it's not a lot, it's only 14% verbatim overlap, but it was significantly more than people who were writing by hand. Uh, so you write more, you get more direct, but when they asked people to answer multiple choice questions, they found that although cons factual items, so direct factual recall for things that uh, the speaker said, there was no difference but there was a significant advantage for writing out longhand for conceptual items. In other words, uh, multiple choice questions that asked you to think a little bit beyond just factual recall, the kind of things you might get on an exam. So this made a big splash because this made it seem like uh, people should not be taking notes by typing. They should be taking notes by writing. Uh, and this caused a lot of people to, um, to want to investigate this a little bit further. Uh, so right now, 2014, when this paper came out, uh, the decision or the conclusion seemed to be that taking notes in a lecture by writing them out on a piece of paper or a notebook was superior. Uh, there was either no difference for factual items or there was an advantage for these kind of conceptual items, the type of things that people would expect to ask uh, on exams. Later, uh, some research found that the advantage seemed to be when people were reviewing their written notes. Uh, so I'm not gonna go through this experiment in great detail. I just wanna talk about the conclusions because I don't wanna uh, run out of too much time here. But uh, what they asked their subjects to do was almost exactly what we're doing now, which was uh, narrated PowerPoint lectures. Uh, so basically they're watching a video lecture, they're doing Zoom class, and they're taking notes either by writing things out or by using Microsoft Word. Um, and then they did multiple choice questions, which were a mixture of fact, relations, concepts, and skills. Um, and what they found uh, was that uh, in the, on the bottom here, where it says function, uh, subjects would either just take notes or they would review those notes. 
And they found that when subjects reviewed the notes later, uh, there was a significant advantage for taking notes by hand. Uh, in other words, your, your performance stayed fairly stable and actually improved a little bit when you reviewed your written notes. The reason they speculate is that when people review written notes, and this was true for the first study, uh, when you write things down, you tend to write kind of sparse. You don't write as many words, you don't transcribe as much, uh, but when you go back, you fill things in uh, and you remember what you wrote and then you expand on that. And that seems to be where the advantage is. The advantage isn't just in the literal act of writing things down. The advantage seems to be in the act of uh, reviewing and expanding on the information. Uh, and this does not seem to be for uh, things that are taken in, on laptop. Uh, one of the reasons they don't, spec, they don't make this claim, but one of the reasons I think it's the case is that if you're taking notes by typing them, you review your typewritten notes, you see that you've written a lot, it looks like there's a lot of verbatim overlap, you say, well, this is what the speaker said. Uh, and so you don't put the extra work into expanding and uh, trying to review your notes and filling in the details. You have to do that with longhand notes, but you don't have to do it with uh, laptop notes. Uh, and they found this uh, for uh, both of their studies. So as long as things were being reviewed, uh, it seemed to be that there was this advantage uh, for longhand notes. Um, at the time, of course, in 2017, was this, uh, there was a, an article, an op-ed in the New York Times by a, a well-known economist, uh, Susan Donarski, uh, who was at the University of Michigan, now I think at Yale University, um, or maybe Harvard University. Uh, and um, uh, she went to the point where she wanted to ban laptops. Uh, and here's her ra uh, rationalization. The best way to settle this question is probably to study laptop use in most colleges. Until then, I find the evidence sufficiently compelling that I've made my decision. I ban electronics in my own class. Now she makes exception for students uh, with learning disabilities who need to use electronics uh, and admits that this is a lack of uh, loss of privacy. Um, she says students may object that a laptop ban prevents them from storing notes on their computers, but smartphones can snag pictures of handwritten notes, convert them to electric format. Uh, even better, outside of class, students can read their own notes and type them if they like. So she's arguing that the real advantage is forcing students to expand on things. Uh, but that said, most professors do not ban uh, laptops from class. Now it's a moot point because you're watching this on a laptop. Um, and it turns out that this effect does not replicate very well. Uh, more recently, uh, in a study that came out just uh, earlier this year, um, a meta-analysis across many different studies. So lots of labs tried to replicate this study. So this is like a meta-analysis and a multi-lab replication uh, found that this effect is not very strong. Uh, what they did find across all of these different experiments is that um, Subjects do write more uh, when they are uh, using a laptop. So this plot shows that the mean is higher for laptops over a uh, longhand for the, num for the word count. Uh, they have more verbatim overlap. So they replicated that part of the study, uh, but they found no difference uh, across a larger sample size in many different studies uh, for attempts to replicate this. So for the most part, uh, this idea that you should not take notes on a laptop uh, does not seem to hold up experimentally. Uh, if there's an advantage, it seems to be that when students take notes by hand, they have to go back and review those notes in a way that forces them uh, to expand on it a little bit more. So if there's an advantage, it might be there. So um, I asked you to uh, do a quick quiz here. And let's, because one of the reasons I'm curious about this is uh, I found that when I'm in a meeting, if I'm at a personal meeting, I tend to take notes uh, by, I don't like to take notes by tapping them. Even though I bring my laptop or my iPad to most meetings, I'm not a very good typist and my notes are not very good. So I do tend to write notes and then transcribe them later. Partially that's because I'm 50, right? I didn't learn how to do stuff on a laptop. Um, but I started wondering like, how do you take notes when you're, uh, how do all of you take notes when you're watching this on a Zoom lecture? I mean, do you take notes on the same computer? Do you try to write them down? Do you have a second laptop? I don't think anybody knows. I have no idea. So I just thought I would ask you all. Um, and it seems like uh, this isn't uh, done in percentages, but uh, out of the 81 of you that answered this question, a small number do it on paper, but most of you do what I suspect 
I do as well, which is you just take notes on the same computer that you're watching the lecture on. So everything is there right in front of you. Uh, a few of you may have a different laptop. Uh, I can imagine that it's possible to even do this by, if you really wanted the full experience, you could you know, uh, Chromecast this to a television screen, right? Big TV screen, uh, have it be like a lecture, and then you could take notes. Uh, I guess if I were in a room where there were two or three other people that I was staying with and we we're all in the same class, that'd be a totally good way to do a, a synchronous lecture. Uh, some of you have an iPad uh, or a Surface Pro with a digital uh, pen. I think that's how my daughter tends to uh, do her notes. Then there's one of you that doesn't take notes, uh, which is a perfectly valid thing to do. Um, what did you say here, really? Are you 50? You do not look at it all, knock on wood. I am 50. I'm actually going to be 51 um, in, uh, uh, um, uh, in, a, in just a month. Uh, so yes, I'm going to be, somebody else mentioned that. I don't look 50. I feel 50, believe me. Um, so I'm going to be 51 in February. Uh, so uh, yes, yeah, I'm an older guy uh, who has no idea how to take notes uh, digitally. Um, so back to uh, not taking notes. Um, I don't take notes uh, for a lot of stuff. Why would I? And in fact, this is a perfectly valid approach to a class like this. You're going to get everything uh, on the lecture. Um, and um, uh, you, why bother taking the notes, right? It's going to be there. You can review it anytime you want. Uh, you know, so some of you may adopt that approach. Uh, some of you may have other uh, approaches. I don't know if anybody mentioned others. Um, and here's another thing that I was interested in. Uh, and I can't see this because my Zoom toolbar uh, is in this way. Okay. Um, do you find it easier or more difficult about the same? Most of you find it about the same, uh, but then the second answer is that it's more difficult to take notes. Uh, I find it much easier to take notes during a live meeting than I do during a Zoom meeting. And that's because there's just so many other things going on uh, during a Zoom meeting. Um, okay, so this is kind of interesting to me. Uh, it suggests that most of us are doing everything on the laptop. And that's great because um, that was the final point that I wanted to bring up. Uh, I'm gonna send this around to you all, by the way. Uh, but this is something I wrote back in October uh, on the Medium platform, it's a blog post, um, where I suggested about how uh, I was having trouble, <laughs> uh, memory trouble uh, from doing so many things on Zoom. And it's not that I didn't like Zoom. Uh, it's just that so many things were being done on this Zoom platform. Uh, and I'll, I'll send the link to this on uh, Teams if I can remember. Um, I will remember, don't worry. Uh, I'm not gonna do it right now, but um, I said that we you know, started working from home. Uh, and here's something that maybe you experienced, but this is my experience as a uh, faculty member. Um, I began to teach online using Zoom for student meetings and recording lecture videos. I would meet weekly with grad students, uh, lab meetings on Zoom, department meetings on Zoom, PhD defenses, master's defenses, informal Zoom talks, Zoom coffee breaks, and Zoom happy hours, which let's, that got pretty stale pretty quickly. Um, academic conferences were online videos. You're doing all your classes online. Basically, everything was online. And soon I was doing all my at work, all my teaching, all my research, all my committee work, all my mentoring from the same screen and the same computer in the same room. Um, and what I noticed was uh, that I started making some mistakes. I started making errors uh, and errors that I didn't used to make. Like never before would I have forgotten who I was talking to uh, or forgotten that I had just met with somebody the day before if I had an office, right? Uh, I didn't make those kind of mistakes. Yes, I'm 51, but uh, I'm not at the point yet where I'm experiencing cognitive decline. And I started having these memory errors. So a lot of my research and teaching work is able to be carried out online, but I started noticing these small changes because I might be talking with one student for 10 minutes about the wrong project. This happened a lot of times over the summer. Uh, I would meet with one of my students and we'd be talking about a project that another one of my students is doing. And this has never happened before. Um, or I might confuse one meeting for another. Uh, and I said that these, I claim that these were source memory errors. So I remembered the student, I remembered the topic, but I was confusing which one was which. And I was more of the absent-minded professor. And the, real, the reason I realized this, and this is what I think that, my guess is that a lot of you have probably made this same observation about your own experience, uh, and that you're probably dealing with this also. Um, 
a possible source for the problem is that everything looked the same. I'm looking at the same screen on the same computer in the same room for everything. Basically for the last year, I've been sitting in my home office. And this was not typical because just like you, there's always been a different place, right? I would lecture in a lecture hall. I would hold seminars in a different room. I'd meet with students in my office. Uh, they would meet with colleagues at the cafe on campus at the Tim Hortons or at Einstein's or any of those places, uh, committee meetings. Uh, so lots of different things. There would be this location-based memory, right? So now I'm in the classroom, I'm thinking about class. And I even joke about it because if I was in class and a student would say, can you post this, you know, can you post a link to that paper? in class, I would say, yes, I will do it, but please remind me by email because as soon as I get back to my office, I'm gonna forget. That's because there's the location specific memory. I'm in the class, I'm in the lecture hall, we're talking about stuff, totally focused on that. I walk up, go up the elevator in the, in the Word building where my office is, get to the fifth floor, and then I completely change uh, my focus. I'm no longer thinking about class, I'm thinking about something else. But, um, you know, with everything being done in the same place, teaching, reading, writing, uh, advising, uh, and I'm also doing things like, you know, recreational stuff, watching. Uh, every day I was in the same location that I taught, wrote, met, carried out analyses. Also the same location, which I read the news, catch up on Twitter, order groceries online. Uh, everything that I'm doing, order stuff from Amazon online, uh, ends up being in the same location. And I'm starting to experience this kind of forgetfulness. It's not that I'm forgetting, it's just that I'm not remembering the same thing. So there's a longer article that goes with this and I'll send the link around on Teams. Uh, but it's something that I think I, in the article, I suggest ways to get around this. So some of the things are to, you know, even little things like changing the format of your screen. Sometimes I switch between light and dark view. I uh, tend to use dark view at night just because it reminds me that I'm working on different things. Um, or you can change, uh, you know, I can work, I can take my laptop and work downstairs on uh, non-class related things, or I might work on my laptop when I'm working on uh, sort of informal writing, working on blog posts, and I don't do that in my home office. Uh, but these are things that we just don't have much experience with. Uh, but one of the things we'll talk about when we talk about memory is that all of the things that help us to use contextual cues, like these location-based cues, that's a benefit for the most part, right? It helps you remember stuff. You've probably all been in that situation where uh, you're, you know, you're, you're living, let's suppose you're on campus, you're living on campus, uh, you're living in London, but then you go back home with your friends and you act a slightly different way. Uh, or you, you know, move to a different town and you act a different way. You act differently in lecture than you do at home. You act differently in a restaurant than you do in a fast food restaurant. So we all have these ways of acting and it reminds us of things. Those location-based cues are important. The problem is when everything is in the same location, they no longer work and they start to interfere. Okay, uh, so that's it. Thank you for sticking with me. Um, this is the take home message and then I'm gonna uh, stop sharing. And if you, by the way, if you have any additional questions, um, by all means, post them up on the chat now. Uh, and I can spend a few minutes uh, after this take home message answering some of those questions before I uh, stop the meeting. But the timing, are we doing all right? Um, oh, great, 11.30, this is perfect. It's exactly when I hope to finish up. Um, what is the name of your upcoming book? Uh, so my upcoming book is called um, How to Think. I'll post a, a link on Teams about it. It's a popular nonfiction book. Uh, it's going to be published in the UK uh, in April. Uh, and Canadian and North American and US publication date will probably be sometime in the summer. Uh, but I will be happy uh, to share information about that. Um, somebody says, will enter any of the examples uh, be on the exam. Some of these personal examples will not be on the exam, um, but some of these other, uh, uh, some of these papers, I'll talk about some of the main findings. Uh, can you show where the PowerPoint's in again? I will do that again in just a minute, Helena. Um, let me give my uh, um, take home message uh, and then I'll answer some of these additional questions uh, and then we can uh, wrap it up for the day. And I appreciate most of you staying here. Um, all right, I'm going to get to all of these questions as best as I can, um, but let me go through take home messages. Psychology is a relatively new science. Uh, by relatively new, I just mean that it's only had a scientific methodology uh, for a little over 100 years. 
Uh, people have been interested in thinking and memories and all that sort of stuff forever. Uh, but we've only had a scientific way to study it uh, since the, the 20th century. And the answers and questions that we have are defined by the methods available. Uh, another take home message uh, is that we rely on memory and heuristics to make decisions most of the time. Sometimes and most of the time that helps, but other times it causes errors and biases. And that example I gave you about the problem of being on Zoom all the time is an example of a heuristic, a location-based cue, usually helps you remember things. It can start to interfere when everything is in the same location. Uh, understanding more about cognitive psychology can help you understand more about yourself, I think, um, and your ability to learn new things, your ability to make sense of your experiences. Um, okay, so I'm going to stop uh, the, the PowerPoint here, uh, and but I'm going to still sh share the screen because some of you had some uh, questions. So let me get to some of those questions. Uh, and where's my chat window? Um, so one of the questions was, uh, what is any of these examples uh, be on the exam? So one of the examples that will be on the exam uh, for, a, uh, and I'm gonna answer a second question about the laptop uh, study. Suppose I ask a question about the original study and I will name the study. I'll say uh, in the original study by Mueller and Oppenheimer on laptops and longhand, uh, which of the following were true? And then I might ask you to select multiple choice, uh, one answer that's true, or which of these is not true. And one of the things that would be true is that people who took notes on the laptop wrote more text. People who took notes on a laptop had more verbatim overlap. People who took notes on a laptop tended to do less well on conceptual items in the original study. Um, I might then ask uh, in, the, in a follow-up study, uh, which of these were replicated. And there you might say in the replication study um, that the, uh, you know, which one of these was true or well, one of the things that was true was the people who took notes on the laptop still wrote more. People who took notes on the laptop still had more verbatim overlap. People who took notes on a laptop did not perform any better on conceptual and factual items. Uh, so that would be an example of how these examples might show up on a multiple choice uh, question. Um, all of these papers, by the way, that I've talked about, I'm going to make sure that they're in the uh, OWL uh, site. So here's our OWL site. Um, and you will find links to them on the uh, page one, the study of cognition. Uh, they're going to be in this resources folder in unit one, uh, which they're not in here yet because I haven't put anything in there yet. Um, and they will also be links to that in the study of cognition. And they will be in the Microsoft Teams site under section one, uh, go into files. This answers the question uh, that Elena had. Um, and let's see, I answered uh, Melissa's question. Uh, uh, Annie's question asked about the name of the upcoming book. It's called How to Think. Uh, and it will be published uh, sometime in the summer, I think. Um, Elena, you asked about uh, the PowerPoints again. They're going to be uh, here in the files directory. Um, under unit one intro. They're also going to be uh, in the OWL directory. Most of this should be sometime later this afternoon or even evening because it's going to take me some time to make sure that the recording worked. It's got to save the recording. Then I've got to upload them to YouTube. I also want to upload them to the um, Teams directory and I'm going to upload the MP4 files to the OWL directory because I know that not everybody can watch uh, YouTube. Um, so all of that will eventually show up in here later today and I'll notify you uh, on uh, Teams when it's available. Uh, if you're in the class and you're not yet on Teams, you can join that over here and it's going to be the best uh, way to sort of interact uh, and ask questions. Uh, eventually, all of this stuff will be up here and you'll see it on the top hand side. So when you go to section one, uh, everything will be in the files directory and you'll see unit one, unit two, unit three, unit four, and then I'm going to have a separate uh, uh, discussion section for exam based questions. Um, there was another question about topics we should read in the textbook. Uh, I usually put together a quick study guide that tells you what to look at. Um, and from every class here on in, uh, for unit two, unit three, and unit four, I will finish each uh, lecture uh, with a couple of multiple choice questions that we can go through. Um, I won't ask you to answer them. Uh, you can. Um, but I'll give some example multiple choice questions, which do occasionally show up on the exam. 
Uh, so you'll have an example, we'll give some direct examples of how I'm gonna assess things uh, and what kinds of questions to expect. So that when the exam time comes around, uh, most of it should be familiar to you uh, and it shouldn't be uh, any major surprises. Uh, final question um, was, uh, when do I have uh, office hours? I do have office hours uh, on Zoom. Uh, you can find them on the calendar uh, which and the course outline. Uh, so if you go to the OWL site, you'll see in the course outline that I have uh, Zoom office hours uh, from Thursday from 1 to 2.30. Um, you can find the link on the course calendar. Uh, and so if you went over onto Thursday, you would see that there's an office hours with a link right there. Um, if you, uh, I will also post the link uh, on the um, team site. These office hours will also be available to my other course, my third year course. Uh, and there will be a, um, a waiting room. So if you have questions uh, and you want to talk to me about something on those, uh, you, you know, you'll join, there'll be a waiting room, I'll let you in. Uh, if there's nobody else there, uh, we can go. Uh, if there are other people there, you may need to wait a little bit. Um, another question, do you recommend reading the chapter assigned before the lecture? I do recommend that. Uh, and the reason I recommend that is that um, the, uh, uh, it, it, it can give you some background and you can see what aspects I'm going to emphasize and what aspects I'm not going to emphasize. Uh, but it's up to you. They're not long chapters. It's not a long textbook. Uh, for those of you that have the ninth edition, uh, I'm going to be reviewing the ninth edition uh, each week. I'll look at the chapter to make sure that I'm covering some of that. But I'm also going to be reviewing the uh, eighth edition uh, because I said you can use either one. Uh, and those of you that haven't seen uh, there is a PDF copy of the 8th edition uh, available in the team site. Uh, it's all right here. Um, so everything's here. Uh, this, uh, you know, the, the 9th edition is better. Uh, it has some newer information, but all of the exam questions uh, can come directly from here. So uh, for those of you that have the 9th um, the edition, I think you've got a, a more update updated version. Uh, if you want to use this, this eighth edition, uh, it's available here uh, in, this, um, in this files directory under the general channel. So that's about all I have. Are there any other questions? Let me check over there. Um, discussion start with unit two, correct. Is that right? I think that is correct. Um, did I say that was right? I think that is right. Let's see what the course outline says. <laughs> <laughs> I actually don't remember. Um, what do I say here about uh, when the next discussion? It's on the calendar. Uh, discussion number one is due. Oh, yes. Yeah, so there's actually no discussion for this week. Discussions start uh, after unit two. Uh, this gives us a chance um, uh, to put things together. Uh, so you can find that, by the way, uh, on the course calendar. Um, so you can subscribe to the course calendar. And I'll remind everybody several times about where to find that. Uh, but you'll see there is a discussion due, uh, and it tells you here on the calendar, the 26th, uh, what's available on the 26th. We can go over here. Um, yeah, I'm just going to close this window here. Uh, suppose we look just by the week. Uh, look at the week of the 24th, and you can see that we're finishing brain science. Uh, we're going to do the uh, object recognition, perception and object recognition unit, um, and discussion number one is due on the 26th, and here's the link for the recording. So on a week-by-week -week basis, most everything should be able to be found uh, on this course calendar. Um, the link for the course calendar, if you want to subscribe on Google or your iPhone calendar, your Apple calendar, or your Outlook calendar, uh, can be found in Teams uh, in the general chat. So it's up above here, and I'll send it around again just to make sure everybody has it. Um, if you get tired of me updating things over and over again, uh, I apologize, uh, but I just want to make sure everybody has everything. Uh, I can only imagine, I've only got to do this for two classes as the instructor. I can only imagine how difficult it is uh, from your end of things to have to track uh, five different classes online. So I apologize in advance for telling you everything multiple times, but I'd rather tell you multiple times and have you ignore it uh, after you've seen it once than have it uh, be missed. Uh, so you'll get a lot of information from me, mostly on the team site. I will continue to send things on the messages uh, on OWL for maybe the next week or so. But then after that, uh, most everything will be here on this uh, team site. Okay, uh, if you have other questions, I'm gonna be stopping the recording now. Um, let's stop, where do I stop the share? 
Um, and I can stop the